right, today is January 11th, 2013. Uh, my name's Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com. Uh, and uh, I'm someone who's voted for Ralph Nader in the past for president and and also Ron Paul. Um, I, I'm, I'm seeing things as uh, priorities, um, namely issues like uh, our election system, uh, our debates, um, corporate welfare, uh, the empire that we have, the drug war, freedom of information, and civil liberties. Uh, those are the common issues that I see as uh, priorities for the United States and perhaps the world. Um, seems like both of the two big to fail parties um, force us to take the bad out of each party and, and leave the good. And um, so I, I have someone who has a little bit higher expectations um, from what we should expect from ourselves and our political system. Uh, and, and basically, I'm someone who's um, very libertarian as far as like the Second Amendment, maybe conservative that way, and uh, and the free market. But I'm also someone who thinks, you know, we maybe we all should have a public option if that's what people want uh, for health care and and be able to, um, you know, negotiate uh, prescription drug prices. And, and I think most, you know, and, and so it's like if you support the Democrats, um, you, you know, you, you won't get your Second Amendment rights, but if you support Republicans, then you won't get, like, health care. And actually with the Democrats, um, another thing is with these uh, uh, semantics, I mean, capitalism isn't what happened during 2008. And Obamacare was the farthest thing away from socialism, yet uh, both sides in the news media call each other uh, back and forth, um, either capitalist or socialism, and blaming both of those when it's actually fascism, the merger of corporation and state. And today, uh, we have Noam Chomsky, who's, um, if you haven't heard of him, real quickly, he's um, written over 100 books. He's a professor at MIT for linguistics. Um, he's like a, almost, I would say, almost a modern day Aristotle in, in a sense. Um, but uh, you can read his hundred books and, and judge for yourself. One of the most popular books that I think you had was Manufacturing Consents, um, and that was also a video that you've uh, updated recently, and and, and that um, is a great introduction, I think, to you. But uh, but but perhaps some of your linguistics work uh, might be as well. And so hopefully today we're going to manufacture some common sense um, and, uh, and maybe a little bit of Thomas Paine style. And so, so good afternoon this Friday, uh, Noam, and, and thanks for um, taking time to do this interview, sir. Glad to be with you. All right, thanks. And so, so uh, I think right now the public is ready. I mean, when we look at the polls, and I just want to give your take. I guess this will focus more on politics because um, libertarianprogressive.com is something I founded about – uh, a little bit less than a year ago, what we did was interview the most independent and third-party candidates that were on the ballots in the U.S., whether they be Green Party candidates, Libertarians, Independents, and I try to specifically just interview people in districts where they were the only alternative candidate, and we're hoping, uh, you know, our vision is 2014, 16, 18, I mean, what we interviewed about 60 candidates uh, in 2012, and the hope is that, you know, maybe some, what if we had at least just one candidate from each state or 50 candidates in the House of Representatives that were not Republicans and Democrats. And uh, I mean, a public, if you look at the Gallup polls, they're, they're tired of Republicans and the Democrats. And and if you, there's something I think that's unprecedented in this generation. And, and maybe future generations will have an innate, um, uh, something built into their DNA. It's called the internet. I mean, um, a lot of things happened uh, after the printing press um, a couple hundred years ago, and, and I think this is even much more powerful. And never has there been a time in history that we've had instant communications around almost the entire globe. And I would like to ask you, I mean, are we in some unprecedented times um, with the Internet, sir? Well, the Internet's undoubtedly important. Uh, I use it all the time. I'm sure you do. Mm -hmm. Everyone I know does. Uh, it's uh, how much of a change it is is another question. So, for example, the speed of communication that you mention is certainly significant. Uh, it's uh, uh, on the other hand, if you look at the uh, increment in speed of communication, the increment that's given by the internet over, say, the telephone or mail is pretty small as compared with the increment from sailing ships to wireless. Uh, you go back uh, late 19th century, if I 
wrote a letter to England. Uh, could take a couple of months to get an answer. Uh, telegraph meant you could get it quite quickly. Uh, internet means you can get it still more quickly. But uh, in terms of increment, it's not that dramatic. Of course, you have access to a great deal more information than you had when you had to go to the library. Uh, on the other hand, the library did give plenty of information if people wanted to use it. So now instead of you know, going down the street or downtown to look at the public library or university library, you can do it in your living room. But uh, the question is how much more how much of an increment is that as compared say to have having public libraries available to people everywhere less so now than before in fact uh so yes it's a change it's an important change uh how much of a whether it's a dramatic change uh, i don't know it's certainly used for all sorts of things i mean as i said i use it research communication uh, activist groups have used it uh, was certainly significant in, say, organizing in Tahrir Square in uh, Egypt during the early days of the Arab Spring. Uh, on the other hand, it's also worth noticing that when the dictator, Mubarak, uh, who, of course, we were supporting, uh, closed down the Internet to try to block the, uh, uh, act the uh, uh, protests, it actually accelerated them. Right. Because people were talking to each other face to face, communicating in other ways. Uh, well, think about Egypt, actually, since you brought up Egypt, um, and that's where the supposedly the Library of Alexandria was. It's kind of like nowadays we all have access to the modern Library of Alexandria, and and, and, it, and don't people kind of have like higher expectations now about getting their information um, more, you know, you know. Uh, higher expectations from the public and everyone can kind of be an intellectual nowadays if they want to research like they almost have no excuse not to yeah but uh, yes there's an increment but having say when i was a kid a teenager uh, having the philadelphia i was in philadelphia having the philadelphia public library available uh, gave me huge resources uh, vastly beyond anything i could ever want to use. I mean, it was very great education. Uh, uh, same if, if you're, say, in a college and you can get to the university library or a public library. The local public library in the town where I live has uh, plenty of materials available. I mean, not everything I want by any means, but a lot. So there's an increment. Yeah, but I, I, I we should... definitely support the libraries. I think, I mean, I have a library card myself and, you know, I love the library i think that's something that even if we didn't even need it anymore we probably should still have it so people can experience you know well i think we still need it i mean i think it's quite different to uh, walk around the stacks of a library and to uh, surf the internet but it's but it's true there's a there's an improvement there's an increment but is it a, how much of an increment is it as compared with other increments, well, like say having public a, libraries available, possibly you know. a, enough to cause a new age of enlightenment or, or a renaissance. Perhaps, do you think uh, the printing I, press did that? Um, you, you know, do you think the printing press might have been the spur of the, um, you, you know, the more modern age of enlightenment a couple hundred years ago? You know, it took over a long period, right. over centuries. Yeah, the printing press was very important. I think it's uh, again speaking as an increment, mm -hmm. uh, having. The printing press, instead of scribes, uh, was a bigger change than having uh, libraries to the Internet. And it had an effect, and I think the Internet will have an effect. But whether it will have the effect of, effect of enlightenment or of indoctrination or of misleading or of uh, diversion, well, that depends on how we use it. Exactly, and that might be for future generations, and 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 for us observing here, um, you know, it, hopefully we can try to be a part of history and, and and not just observe it. I mean, you know, there's so many. Um, like I heard a, a, a debate, or or maybe it was just kind of a speech that you were giving. Um, 
uh, when considering, you know, the ghost in the machine, I, I mean, why, it's kind of like essentially why worry about things that, um, uh, you, you know, we can't really help. We're just beating our head against the wall on, on issues like that. And, um, and people can watch a lot of your speeches online. And, and to me, it's, kind of a similar thing with arguing between like so-called what we call U.S. libertarians versus progressives and that's why I named the website libertarianprogressive.com to find some common issues like if we just ended our empire and ended the drug war that would be a great start right there and that could snowball into lots of other uh, effects uh, uh, big time I mean that's a huge part of our budget is empire and our relations overseas and the drug war has affected lots and lots of families um, and financially and uh, in our morale. Um, but um, like, kind of like thinking well, what's going to unite, how, when are people gonna see um, certain issues as the best interest? Um, because, I mean, if we keep doing the same thing over and over again, electing Republicans and Democrats, I mean, there's always, usually in every district, there's almost no excuse. There's always an independent or third party candidate, someone who's saying, hey, vote for me. I'm going to end, I'm going to vote to end empire spending. I'm going to vote to end the drug war. I'm going to vote for your civil liberties, fairer elections. But they only get like 1% every single year almost. Maybe sometimes they get up to 5% or something. And, um, uh, I mean, people need to break out of this vicious circle, and the way to break out of a vicious circle is to learn from history and learn from the past, and hopefully that's, you know, with the internet looming over there, that's going to force us to hopefully at least um, observe the past, uh, if, if not learn from it. But why worry about politics, about things that aren't going to happen? Like, what if Ron, someone like Ron Paul got, like, progressive support, or what if someone like Ralph Nader got... Um, like libertarian support. Um, I mean, the issues that the libertarians and progressives worry about, like people worry about Ron Paul with his health care and his social security stance, but they agreed with him on the empire spending, the drug war, civil liberties, probably freedom of information. Um, the things that they were afraid of of him were is, is never going to happen anyways. It's kind of like trying to find out if there's a ghost in a machine. We're, we're not going to know, and, and he, he's never going to get rid of social security or, um, or Medicare. Uh, so the things that people fear about him it's never going to happen in 100 years but the things that people agree with him about are things where he actually could make a difference as commander-in-chief by pulling back the empire spending or at least diverting it and forcing them to pull back on it and um you know recognizing people like julian assange and etc uh, uh you know as far as our freedom of information goes um what, what do you say to, to that i mean when are we gonna wake no. up and, and and hopefully elect a new congress i mean i agree with you totally that's where we can make the difference every two years it's like an emergency break in the congress where people can all of a sudden make a change i mean if we had 50 what would happen if we had let's just say even 10 non-republicans and democrats elected to Let's say the House. Do you think that would be enough to start a, you know, a peaceful political revolution in this country? Break the uh... one thing. It would depend what those ten non-Republicans and Democrats. Uh, well, let's say were half were of. Green Party and half were Libertarians, and they both well, united on a platform of like five similar well, issues of ending the. Well, what issues? For example, would they unite on a platform of destroying the EPA, of uh, ending regulation on? Uh, uh, carbon dioxide emissions uh, on uh, ending regulation of financial institutions. Uh, if they agreed on things like that, we'd be in even deeper trouble than we are now. Well, I, I don't mean those issues. No, those are some of the ones that, like, how about this? Ending the empire spending, like the um, 800 bases overseas, yeah. um, ending the drug war, and um, adhering to our civil liberties, um, freedom yeah. of information, whistleblowers, and, uh, you know, maybe having all the candidates in the debates or something uh, might leave that. But the imp just the empire spending and the drug war, ju just, just even if it was those two things. Well, let's take empire, empire spending and the drug war. Uh, actually, a considerable majority of the population uh, favor reducing the military budget. Uh, and in fact, I haven't seen current figures, but as of a couple of years ago, a considerable majority of the population uh, felt that in the case of international crises, uh, the UN should take the lead, not the United States. In fact, a majority even thought we ought to give up the veto at the UN and uh, follow the will of the majority, uh, of, uh, uh, even if we didn't like it. Well, you know, those concepts weren't even 
any none of that was even under discussion uh and uh, i don't think having 10 if we had 10 uh people in congress who uh, expressed the will of the majority on this issue i don't think it would make much difference for example majority of the population right now that wants all sorts of things right. that aren't even under discussion uh so for example a considerable majority uh, think that the big problem facing the country domestically is not the deficit, but rather uh, joblessness. Uh, they I happen to think they're right, and so does uh, the business press, incidentally, uh, But that's and many economists. Uh, but that's not even under discussion. Well, that's uh, interesting. Yeah, I always find the business news to be a little bit more objective than the regular news. But anyways. Well, okay. that's not the news. It's... It's what it's what's happening within the political class. Uh, those who at, at Congress, uh, the White House, uh, the commentators in the media, uh, they keep to a framework of discussion, which happens to be different from what the majority of the population wants. And if we look further, uh, we find uh, 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 we find quite a lot more. So, for example, uh, there's a very interesting work in the professional political sciences, serious work on uh, polling and attitudes uh, on the one hand and policy on the other and how they relate. Actually, the best work in the field recent couple, last couple of years has shown pretty convincingly, I think, that uh, about 70% of the population, the lower part on the income level, uh, have no influence whatsoever on policy, no matter what they think. And as you move up the income level beyond that, you begin to get more and more influence rather slowly. When you get to the very top, they essentially get what they want. Well, that's a serious problem. And that problem isn't going to be remedied by having five Green Party people and five uh, uh, U.S. libertarians. Well, w- w- wouldn't that, but um, if if there were that many like independents, let's say, or, or non-mainstream you know mainstream party candidates in the House, that's something the media would not be able to ignore. It opened up people's um, perceptions. I mean, sometimes, like people said, like when, when a baby sees like three dots or something, I, I think in some of um, your studies, I mean, they'll, they'll put something there to, to because they expect something. And, and don't people expect something from the Republicans and the Democrats after voting for them or seeing them win so long? Uh, sure, that's, that's why they're so unpopular. Yeah, and, take a look at the polls of. Uh, well, we do have I mean, alternatives. I mean, there at least our well, alternatives the, are, are Greens and Libertarians. Are not like you know like fascistic. Uh, I mean, there are some fascist parties as third parties in the United States, but I mean those. But the main two big alternative parties are Green Party and you know Libertarians mostly. I mean, so we have like a good alternative to conservatism, um, being the Republicans and, and progressives instead of the Democrats. I mean, you and you, I, and you, every, uh, four years I, I've seen you endorse Ralph Nader and Jill Stein. So, I mean, seems like, um, you find that as a, as a liable option too. Somehow. We, we got cut off. We're back. And, yeah. um, okay. And, yeah. Let's go ahead. Okay, sir. And actually, um, so, so I, I, I was just saying that I've admired the fact that, that you've always um, given your endorsement to uh, at least the last decade or so uh, to, to Ralph Nader, to Jill Stein. So it sounds like you do believe in the election process as a way. I think we should focus on, uh, as a, like my personal opinion, is Congress more. I mean, that's where, you know, a lot of people, the, the, what I run up into is, yeah, and I'm sure you've heard it too. I, I don't want to waste my votes on on a third party candidate. Um, and and so maybe people they, they're more likely maybe to quote unquote waste their votes um, when it comes to maybe the legislative body. M- maybe given that more of a chance for third parties yeah. and, and and independents and seeing it as an all, real viable solution. I mean, basically, someone who's not going to sell out. I mean, someone's real. You don't have to agree with them on every issue, and and most of the issues you might disagree maybe on a libertarian. But but the issues you really disagree on are the issues they're not really going to have much of an impact on uh, the, the issues you do agree on. Maybe, maybe they will. Uh, that's what I'm hoping for. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to, you know, I, I really started out as a libertarian. What kind of got me to, to open be open-minded to like a public health care option and things like that is, n- number one is that if you have a program that pays for itself, um, 
And, and number two is that it's completely voluntary. So if you have a public option, uh, that's completely voluntary. If you can save money by not having overhead, by paying CEOs large salaries, or you can buy in bulk, or it has oversight by um, you, you know uh, the public, by elected officials, then I see no problem with that. And, and if that can compete, kind of like the post office against UPS, FedEx, um, to me, that's legitimate, and, and I don't see how a libertarian can argue against it if it pays for itself and, and if it's voluntary. And, um, and, uh, so I, and so now I fully support a public option. I think it would be good for business as well. I mean, a lot of, like, I mean, you're a big fan of Adam Smith. Uh, I mean, in some ways, I cons you're more conservative than the conservatives we have now. And, um, and you're not the same kind of liberal as people paint on the media as, as what they call leftists. Um, I think people really need to look at your work and, and be open-minded to it. Um, and, and we do appreciate you in this interview here. Uh, so I'm just, I, I guess I'm more practical. I mean, to me, if we just end the empire, just war on drugs, couple things that we agree on, we can change the whole world. Um, uh, so, so kind of, and kind of like George Washington stepped down after eight years in office. Maybe us as a collective United States might be able to step down as being the empire to the world. What do you think about that? Well, you raised a lot of points. I can't answer all of them, but just to clarify one point of fact, uh, I did endorse uh, uh, Nader and uh, Jill Stein in the primaries, okay. but not in the elections. I see. We could go into that. Uh, the uh, it's a, there's a significant difference. No, thanks for uh, clarifying. Uh, that, that's yeah, that's a good and, point. And, and plus, you could be in a state where it might matter more, and it doesn't yes, matter more. I, so uh, yes, like I voted for Jill Stein, but this is a safe state. Right, right. Massachusetts. No, that that makes sense. But, that's all yeah, strategic. But, uh, yeah, I think so. I was in favor voice. of what's called strategic voting. Right. Not that I take the elections very seriously. I think the elections should take about five minutes of our time, and then we should go on doing important things. But during that five minutes, there are a couple decisions to be made. Uh, the, uh, I mean, I think the chances of, I mean, if say uh, Ralph Nader were elected or Ron Paul was elected president, or we had ten people like them in Congress, the chances of ending the empire and the drug war would be essentially nil, because there are forces driving that uh, that go beyond. A couple of votes in Congress, or who's sitting in the White House, uh, and we have to look at those. For example, the forces that lead to the outcome that I mentioned earlier: uh, seventy percent of the population have no influence on policy at all, no matter what their opinions are. Or let's take a look at Congress voting for Congress. Actually, if you take a look at the votes for Congress last, just take this last election. Uh, actually, a majority of House votes went to Democrats. But a large majority of those elected went to Republicans. Well, that tells us something. It Furthermore, something more yeah. something much more significant. There was a recent study by uh, Thomas Ferguson, political, very good political scientist, who's done the main work for many years on uh, the relation of uh, campaign funding to policy and to electoral outcomes. He just did a study in which he found that uh, if you take a look at the congressional elections, the probability of um, an, an election for, to pick one party, say the probability of election for a Democrat was proportional to the percentage of campaign funding that went into that person's election, similarly for a Republican. And in fact, there's about a straight line uh, from uh, all the way across, which effectively tells you that the House elections were pretty much bought, uh, and he's done subsequent work which shows that that apparently goes back as far as we have records, which is about 1980. Well, you know, these are all quite significant facts, uh, as is the fact that uh, the, the concern of a majority of the population to focus on jobs rather than deficit uh, doesn't enter into the political class uh, discussions. It's all deficit, because that's what the financial institutions care about. Uh, same with the questions about empire that I mentioned. Uh, to repeat, the majority of the population thinks that we should cut back our huge military spending. Uh, uh, and uh, as of a couple of years ago, again, I haven't seen a recent poll, uh, majority felt we should leave uh, uh, 
uh, which, which leave international conflicts uh, to the United Nations well, following their lead. But the public is awake, so... Wait, but I mean, it doesn't so, enter into the political system. But, but you're and not we have giving to ask up. Why. You're not giving up. You're giving no, more interviews no. than ever. You're giving more speeches yeah, than ever. Yeah, but they're not, not for electing. Up. I started sure, a new but, website. I'm interviewing people. So, so we can't give up. I mean, what's the... Well, I'm not saying we should give up. Yeah. But let me repeat. Elections, I think, should take maybe five minutes to make a decision about. And then we should turn to the important work, like... Uh, uh, education, organizing, activism, and so on, to try to train, ch change the basic conditions under which these decisions are made. And that's a big job. Now, what you know, we could talk about uh, the positions of, I think there are major, the chances, so I, I don't quite agree that it's practical to say that if we had a couple more independent Congress people, uh, We'd end the drug war and end the empire. Well, I don't start. think that's what it works. And maybe two years later, we would have 50 independents and third parties. Yeah, I, I don't think that would. I, I mean, the Republican Party was the third party at one time, right? Well, look, you take a look at the party system in the United States. Since it's basically since the Civil War, uh, we have had sectional parties. Um, they've changed names recently, but there was a a sectional party for the Confederacy and a sectional party for the North. You look at the uh, last election, 2012, at the uh, red-blue uh, electoral vote the day after in the, in the newspapers. It was the Civil War. Now, the effect of that is that both parties, very early, late in the 19th century, were taken over by, essentially by uh, wealthy entrepreneurs and finance banks. Uh, they became uh, uh, kind of factions of uh, two factions of a business party. They didn't represent popular interests. Uh, we're still, in many ways, stuck with that. Well, I think uh, there aren't any question. People like uh, maybe you, myself, or people that are politically active and care might need to ask because people don't want to waste their vote, and they'll vote for Democrat or, or Republican because they don't want to waste their votes, and they'll vote strategically, which I think is smart to influence the primaries as, as well as the general election. But um, I mean, the, the the main argument needs to be then more fundamental. If, if these third party and independent candidates got on the debate, I think more of them would end up getting elected. So the, the question even before, like, should you vote for Republican, Democrat or third party? Well, I, that, that's I, that's I, not the question. I think this, the question, I think should be, the question be, well, why sorry. aren't they allowed in the debates? Why aren't independent? I think the question is more fundamental than that. Okay. Uh, when you have a, uh, an extreme imbalance, when you have uh, a high concentration of wealth and income, uh, it's going to have an effect on the political system in all kinds of ways. And that's the fundamental point. In fact, you can see that as the concentration of wealth increased sharply under the policies of the last roughly 30 years, essentially since Reagan, uh, the, uh, the choices in the political system have narrowed. Both parties have moved far to the right. Uh, these are fundamental problems. And uh, one of the, and unless those are addressed, uh, we're not going to have a, well-functioning political system. Furthermore, at least my priorities as far as policy, I mean, I think the drug war is quite important. And incidentally, the United States is very isolated on the drug war. I don't know if you followed the latest uh, hemispheric conference yeah, in South Columbia. America. Yeah, yeah in Columbia a couple of months ago. Uh, there were basically two issues, that uh, two major issues. One was, should Cuba be admitted into the uh, hemispheric, uh, you know, conferences, and second, uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, the drug war. The, uh, should there be moves towards decriminalization of drugs? On those two issues, the main ones, the United States was totally isolated. The United States and Canada, totally isolated from the rest of the hemisphere. If there's another conference, the U.S. may not be even even be invited. So we're pursuing policies which are highly isolated. Actually, the same is true on empire too. Uh, so take, you know, take what both political parties now say is the gravest threat to world peace. If you looked at the presidential debate, that's what they emphasized over and over, uh, namely Iran's Iran uh, programs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a very minority position in the world. For example, in the Arab world, if you look at the populations in the Arab world, which are polled by Western polling agencies all the time. Uh, they don't like Iran because 
hostilities go back hundreds of years. But they don't regard them as a threat. The threat they see is Israel and the United States. In fact, in some right on the eve of the Arab Spring, uh, Western U.S.-run polls showed that a majority, in some places a big majority, thought that the region would be safer if Iran had nuclear weapons to counter the real threats. Now, they don't want nuclear weapons. But putting that aside, I mean, here what's reported is the Arabs support us in Iran. And if you take a look, uh, the commentators are referring to the Arab dictators. Yes, the Arab dictators support us. Populations oppose us. Uh, but that's barely mentioned. Uh, but there's a, but there's a further question. Uh, how, let's say it's a threat. Okay, we agree with Obama and uh, 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 Romney and you know the press and so on. It's the gravest threat to peace. What do you do about it? Well, there's one very simple step, uh, a lot simpler than war or sanctions, which are brutalizing the Iranian people. Uh, a, the step would be to move towards establishing a nuclear weapons-free zone in the region. Now, is that pie in the sky? Not in the least. It's uh, supported by almost the entire world. Uh, such strong support, in fact, that uh, uh, the United States has been compelled to register at least formal support for it. Now, it's a very immediate thing that can be done. There was supposed to be a conference uh, right now, in fact, either December or January, in Finland, to an international conference to carry this forward. Well, in early November, uh, Iran agreed to attend the conference. A couple of days later, uh, the Obama administration canceled the conference. Uh, the Arab states said that they would proceed, but uh, of course they can't do anything without the United States. Uh, that wasn't even reported. I mean, people can't protest it or can't object to it or for that matter approve of it because they don't know about yeah, it. Yeah, people can't make a fully informed decision. Okay, but that has nothing to facts. To, I mean But they, if you, not they don't know any of the facts. Any of the facts. But I don't think that any of the independent candidates talked about it. They probably don't know about it. Well, How actually, could they? I th did you see the um, debate between Jill Stein and Gary Johnson, the free and equal debates? I, I think they both actually um, uh, agreed on this issue. and, and, and On a nuclear weapons-free zone? Not, uh, no, but on the issue of Iran. Um, and, well, uh, but that's what I'm talking okay. about. There's a method, a sensible method to approach it. And I'm not criticizing the two of them. I think they probably never heard of it. Uh, how could they? I mean, you have to. See, so you do have, let's go out here, Internet question. If you have the Internet, you can find out about it. But just having the information available is no use. You have to just, it was, you could also find things out in libraries. You have to know what to look for. Uh, and knowing what to look for means uh, having a, uh, uh, knowing what to look for can only be achieved by a high level of organization and activism in which the kind of information that isn't going to make it to the mainstream will get to be known. Well, that's, in my view, things like that are much more important than the decision about whether to do, how to do your strategic voting. Okay, I agree. I mean, that, maybe that's more fundamental. I, I mean, um, and, and in, I, I, like that kind of goes along the same lines. I think one of the biggest boosts for civil liberties in the, in the 60s was um, – our TV coverage, our media coverage on it, when people saw the victims of, uh, you know, the civil rights uh, movement, that just kind of the same way when people read Uncle Tom's Cabin. I mean, people felt empathy for mm -hmm. our fellow human beings, and 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 that's why we don't see like the tragedies of war on television. Because if people had to see those images every day, I think you know most people in the United States would be against this empire. Uh, and, and so, but yes, they are against it. They are already against it. I mean, even without well, seeing that. Well, in many respects, you know, I mean, you have to take care, have to qualify that. But in many respects, they are against it. I mentioned a couple, but they're even much more far-reaching ones. Like, for example, at the end of the Vietnam War, uh, 1975, uh, roughly 70% of the population described the war, I'm quoting from the polls, as fundamentally wrong and immoral not a mistake. You cannot find a word to that effect in mainstream media, in the academic world, in the professional journals, uh, in the political system. Uh, what you get in the political system is uh, a noble cause uh, that uh, failed because uh, we made mistakes. 
uh, now, you know, you ha- that's after a very high level of popular organization and activism, and still uh, it didn't it didn't penetrate into the uh, uh, into the mainstream. It's going to take a lot more. It's hard work. I mean, it does have effects. You're right about the. Take your example of the civil rights movement in the South. You're, you're right, but it was. But there are a couple of qualifications. One is it was pretty slow, it took couple, some time, and secondly, it was limited. To see how limited it is, listen to the speeches on Martin Luther King Day. Uh, I'm glad we have Martin Luther King Day. He was a very important figure. Uh, the speeches typically end with. Uh, I Have a Dream, 1963. Martin Luther King didn't end his work in 1963. In fact, he went on. He went on from uh, uh, issues of voting rights in the South to uh, issues of uh, poverty, the rights of the poor, uh, housing. Uh, He wanted to, in fact, uh, he went on, he actually went went on and uh, he came, he referred, he, he brought the issues to the North not just racist sheriffs in Alabama, yeah, sure, we can applaud the, opposing them, uh, but also things that are happening in, in the North with, say, uh, housing, poverty, etc. He was, he was killed, after all. He was assassinated while he was uh, supporting, a, he was in Memphis, supporting a, uh, 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 a strike of public workers, a sanitation workers' strike. He was, he was on his way to Washington, to lead a poor people's camp, to try to form a, a lead a poor people's campaign, a, civ- a human rights campaign. He called it not a civil rights campaign. Actually, the march went on, but yeah, we do uh, need to have were... eternal vi- vigilance. Uh, that's correct. Well, and, 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 but and... my my point is that the media coverage stopped yeah. at the point when he turned to class issues and to the north. Uh, not totally stopped, but essentially what I've just described is very little known. What's known is uh, look how much he opposed racist sheriffs in Alabama, which is easy for us to say. The other things aren't easy for us to say. And if you listen to the speeches the next Martin Luther King Day, you'll hear the same thing, I'm sure. I guess I'm I'm just an optimist. It's kind of like a relationship. I mean, if we're in an abusive relationship where our spouse doesn't treat us right, which I kind of see us like with the Republicans and Democrats, eventually to break that vicious cycle so it doesn't happen to our kids, so our kids don't get abused too, I mean, we're going to have to break this relationship and find somebody else that's or or just be with nobody. And and there are people that are asking for that. Sir, if I could um, just do some quick word associations just for fun, kind of like like I'm, af- I'm afraid I won't be able to do it. I have to leave. This is over. But let me just say one word. Sure. The question is where we concentrate our energy. First of all, I mean, there are a lot of things to say about the uh, policies of the various alternative parties. We didn't even get into that. Yeah. But uh, uh, the real question, I think, is what is where should we focus our energies on uh, trying to get a couple of people elected to Congress or to doing the uh, educational and organizational and activist work that can change the general climate of opinion sufficiently so that you will get popular. Could they be the uh, same thing? Could, could, well, I, I don't, yeah, it's not quite the same thing. My, my feeling is that they're not contradictory. You can do them both, but uh, my feeling is the latter is considerably more I mean campaigning like Ron Paul didn't believe he'd actually become president but just the fact of him stepping up he got a big platform right he did and it was a pretty bad platform in my opinion yeah. but that gets into the policies right well I do appreciate but, which yeah, yeah. And, and, and maybe sometime in the future um, I mean have you have you ever ran or thought about running yourself no? God no I'd be impossible I've never even been appointed we have a floating chair of the department it circulates, but I'm the one person who was never picked because they know I'd make such a mess of it. Well, um, thanks, um, and uh, yeah. I appreciate your time and, and your input here, and 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 hopefully, um, you know, we've transferred some enthusiasm for for yeah. the future here and, and this new year, uh, where. Um, hopefully anything's possible. If it's not, you know, we, we can't prove that it's not or, or it is, but um, just working on well, that premise. Um, yeah. Keep struggling for it. Yeah. Take okay, care. Good I, luck on what you're doing. Thank yeah. you, sir. Um, yeah. Take care. Thanks. Yep. Bye.